My name is Simon Bronner. I'm project consultant for the Oral History Project of the House of Representatives. I'm here today with Robert O'Donnell of the 198th District, who served from 1974 to 1993 and had the roles of caucus chairman, majority whip, majority leader, and speaker of the House. Welcome, speaker. Thank you. I wanted to begin by asking you about your childhood and family life. Well, um, I'm the grandson of uh, immigrants, and my dad was a, a trolley and bus driver in Philadelphia. And uh, I grew up in a traditional uh, Irish Catholic household in some sense. Uh, my mother, however, was a teetotaling, fire-breathing Methodist. And um, that created a, a interesting dynamic, as you might imagine, for religious discussions. Uh, I lived in a neighborhood in Philadelphia called Germantown. And the neighborhood context was my whole life. We lived in the kind of neighborhood where uh, you'd borrow something from the people across the street, and they would borrow something from the people up the street who would have your son go to the store for them. And so there was a real sense in that neighborhood that you were part of something somewhat larger than yourself and that you didn't need to be involved in transactions. You didn't need to be buying and selling and renting and that sort of thing. And uh, the neighborhood was, was my whole life, really. Um, I had never, until I um, went to law school, I had never actually gotten out of the neighborhood in any way. In fact, still live uh, in that neighborhood, uh, or in sort of uh, the next neighborhood over. But I've always lived in the same legislative district, never lived anywhere else, never even went away to college. So the neighborhood context was extremely important. My family was, uh, I grew up in the best possible way. Uh, my dad was a, a gentleman, and uh, he was active in the church. He was active in the Boy Scouts when I joined the Boy Scouts. And he was active in his union. He was a shop steward at one point. And uh, my mom always had, once we went to school, uh, she had a job as a uh, crossing guard near the school. And then later uh, became a, a meter maid downtown. And uh, so it was a very working class, stable, uh, wonderful kind of environment. Our home was very loving and very civil. and. As I look back on it, I realized that that was very, very fortunate. I thought everyone grew up that way. Turns out they didn't. Uh, and um, that was very, very important, and I think really was a very shaping kind of influence for me. And my parents believed that um, it's what you practice, not what you preach, that matters. So the values in our home were values that weren't taught. They were values that were lived. And so you... I picked that up kind of implicitly. And both my parents have put a high value on education, although neither of them went very far in school. They were both readers, and my mother taught me to read before I went to school. So I was reading off, uh, obviously you begin with the children's books and whatnot, but I was reading off cereal boxes and milk cartons and whatnot. And um, so I kind of had a jump uh, on things when I, when I went to school. So they, the, the family, and the neighborhood really were very, very important in terms of shaping my kind of perspective on things. The other element of that was uh, I went to school a good two blocks away, which is sort of the, the edge of the known world, you know, was, was the school. And uh, for eight years, I went to St. Francis of Assisi, which is, was operated and run by the Sisters of St. Joseph. And um, although I and a lot of other people have had fun with, with being taught by the nuns in the 50s. Uh, it was a fabulous, fabulous experience. And only in retrospect do I realize what a remarkable group of women the nuns were. And uh, their contribution to all of us growing up, but certainly personally, I feel remarkably indebted to them. Just terrific. So I grew up in the best possible way, I think. What in your experiences prepared you for public life and politics? Well, I guess uh, a whole lot of those experiences. Uh, first of all, um, when I was in college, uh, I was introduced to uh, by a fellow student to her father, who was a judge and who had been involved in politics. And um, he, after, because I was 
what, what euphemism shall I use? I was outspoken in college. I was working midnight to eight and arrived at class at 8.30 and not about to brook a lot of nonsense, as you might imagine. So uh, I was fairly outspoken. So she was intrigued, unfortunately, just by <laughs> the rhetoric. So she took me home to meet, meet her father and um, uh, we had a great conversation and he wanted to get me involved in politics and he offered to help me. And that was so striking because he wasn't part of my family. He didn't even live in the neighborhood, and here he was offering to help me. In those days, I knew how things worked. I'm not so sure now, but in those days, I was confident about how things worked. I was trying to figure out, what is his angle? Well, he didn't really have an angle, and when I pressed him, he said, well, I'm going to help you here, and later on, you'll help somebody else. And it was the best kind of politics. It was the kind of politics that resonated in the experience of the neighborhood, where, um, in effect, you put in the pot and you get to take from the pot. You know, you're part of some community that's doing something larger than yourself. He, he got me involved in a campaign, and in that political campaign, I was stunned by the ambitions of the people in the campaign. They were interested in creating a better world than the one they found. And I thought, my goodness, I, I thought one's ambitions were supposed to be limited to getting a good job. And here I thought it was in some measure arrogant, but in some way, measure intoxicating, that people would, would take on the larger world and do something about it. And I think that was a wonderful experience. After I got elected the first time, um, I went back campaigning, and I'm knocking door to door and remembering now that my mother had been the crossing guard in front of the school for generations. And I'm knocking on doors, and uh, uh, I come to this one uh, home, and the woman opens the door, and I said, hello, and I'm about to introduce myself. She says, I know who you are. And I think, that's right, I'm the state representative from around here. And she said, you're Ruth's boy, aren't you? <laughs> so another valuable experience that one collects along the road that is helpful in public life is a measure of humility. And um, you don't want too many of those, but it's nice every now and then to have that tempered by the humility. So um, there were a whole set of, of life experiences in that little village, if you were, uh, that were quite instructive and, and very, very useful going forward. What led you to run for office in the first campaign of the House? Well, I had worked in a campaign in 65 and found it fascinating, just uh, an intriguing kind of exercise. In uh, the late 60s, I was involved off and on. And then in 1970, I worked for Milton Schaap's campaign. I was the, the body guy. Uh, I would take milk all around the state. I drove the car, carried the bags, et cetera. And uh, then in 71, I ran Bill Green. Bill Green was a candidate for mayor of Philadelphia in the primary of 71. And I ran his field organization. And growing out of that campaign, we had a huge number of volunteers and people that were involved. And it was a very exciting time to be in politics. There was a sense of change in the air. And um, in any event, a, a whole bunch of us got involved for the first time and said, OK, what do we do now? And in 1972, we decided we would run for committee person, which is the base job in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party. Uh, we were all Democrats. So we decided to run for committee person and then see if we could elect a ward leader and maybe we could elect somebody to the legislature and so on. And uh, I was going to be the nominee for the legislature. And at the very last minute, they changed the reapportionment, and I was knocked out. As, uh, as the legislature was just impossible to run. But the district was carved in such a way that a fellow named David Richardson, with whom we were working at the time, um, Dave said he was going to run on the east side of Germantown Avenue. And I would already bought a home on the west side of Germantown Avenue, a different legislative district. So we continued. Uh, we ran. A whole lot of people ran for committee person. This was, uh, you know, grassroots. And we elected a ward leader. Democratic City Committee refused to seat the ward leader. So I took them to federal court and sued the party to seat the ward leader we had elected. So to make a long story a little shorter, they ultimately had to seat our ward leader. And in 1973, the incumbent legislator 
um, ascended the bench, leaving the legislative seat that I happened to be in open. And I was still enthralled and excited by politics, and we were a grassroots reform movement was underway. And um, it was an exciting time, and, and I just became fascinated by the prospect of, of running and very much impressed with the notion that you could achieve concrete results if you had a measure of power outside the neighborhood that could be brought to bear on the local kinds of problems. Um, so that was, I guess, the sum and substance of my motivation. By that time, I was a lawyer and a teacher, and um, this just seemed like an exciting thing to do. And ran and with some success. Now, interestingly, it was a special election, so there was no primary to be had. There was a primary, but there was also a special at the same time. And um, the party's endorsement became critical. Uh, so I researched the party's rules and discovered that at that time, for a special election, a convention of the committee people was required. So the decision of the party would have to go back to the grassroots, mm -hmm. which gave me a chance at it. But of course, the powers that be did not want to have any kind of grassroots participation. They wanted the ward leaders to do it. So I went to the party chairman and said that I'd like to be the endorsed candidate of the party, and alternatively, we'd be litigants in federal court, having already secured the support of the majority of the committee people. So, and now I'm acting as if I did this. The truth is that there were a whole lot of people who were enormously helpful in getting this thing off the ground. My first election, we put 400 people on the street. Um, so you can imagine this was a genuine grassroots kind of effort, not a charismatic campaign. Um, so in any event, the party chairman, who was quite sensible and, and thought that I was probably less crazy than my reputation, um, uh, agreed and went along, and they, I was the endorsed candidate in 74. And there was resentment uh, for that, uh, particularly among the people supporting Frank Rizzo, who was the mayor, um, because I had run Green's organization against Rizzo in 71, and, and also they believed that I had sort of finessed the party endorsement to get this seat, and it, there's a measure of truth to that. So that all culminated into, into a, a tough fight in 78, but that takes us through the... How about the decision to be Democratic? Was that something you thought about? No. It was never a conscious decision. Um, uh, my dad was a Democrat. Uh, my mom was a Democrat. When it came time for me to register to vote, you know, my dad said, you got to register, that's for sure. And he said, you probably ought to register Democrat because they're, they're the ones that have supported people like us, meaning, you know, working people. And how has the district changed the since district? those days? Yes. Well, the district has been reconfigured, that's for sure. Um, the neighborhood I grew up in has really fallen on hard times economically. That's certainly true. And I think there's very few neighborhoods left, not only in my district, but in the city of Philadelphia, where you could enjoy the kind of life that I enjoyed growing up. In your time as representative, was this an adjustment for you, seeing the changes in the district and responding to them? Well, yes and no. I mean, the district, as configured originally and then subsequently by reapportionments, was always a district where you had a big variety of folks. We had white working class folks, working class black folks, poor black folks. We had middle class, white and black. Um, so it was always racially um, mixed, and it was always economically mixed, that's for sure. Were there other memorable campaigns that you recall? Well, 1978 was probably the most memorable campaign. This is when the, the party leadership and the mayor and everybody really came after me, and they were going to get rid of me finally. And uh, that was a fabulous campaign. Um, a tremendous number of people involved, great grassroots um, support. And um, I had friends from across the city that came and, uh, came and worked, worked divisions for me and worked. We had some, my friend Bob Borsky, um, who at that point was in the house, he brought some of his committee people over from Bridesburg. I remember this one Polish-speaking couple that handled the neighborhood for us in Maniunk and went door to door for me. Um, I remember this couple 
I particularly remember Marge and Jack Hohenstein, um, whose main interest in politics was dealing with world hunger. It wasn't clear to me how a state representative was going to help with that, but they were just such good-hearted people. And they wanted to volunteer in this effort, and we brought them over to work in the district. Um, let me return to Marge and Jack in a minute. That election, they moved the polling places, the powers that be moved the polling places. They took the machines out of one of my most productive divisions and put, it, put the machines out of the neighborhood and into a high-rise housing uh, project. It was senior citizen and controlled by the housing authority and controlled by the mayor. And the access was controlled at the front door and so on. So I was in court all night, um, the night before the election, getting an injunction forcing them to return the machines. So I got back from court at about 7 a.m., having been up all night, and just went to bed. And by 8 o'clock, it was pouring rain. It was a drenching downpour. And my campaign manager came in and woke me up and said, you know, it's pouring out there. It's very dispiriting. You've got to go out and go, you know, polling place to polling place to sort of rally the troops. And um, <laughs> so I went around to each of the polling places, and I changed my clothes four times. I had it in the car. And I'd get drenched, and, you know, and the folks were just not discouraged. And at the end of the day, I wound up in a neighborhood called Maniunk, which was a Frank Rizzo stronghold, and a fellow named Al Perlman was very close to the mayor and was a city councilman and the ward leader and ran a vertible machine up in Maniunk. And so we were supposed to get killed in Maniunk, right? So in any event, we had our troops out there. Marge and Jack Cohenstein, I'll never forget, coming up to the last polling place, and I'm, I'm approaching the polling place, and there's a guy standing outside in the rain. All the workers for all the candidates are inside. He's standing outside in the rain, buttonholing people. It was Jack Owenstein. Won the division by one vote. Well, that, that turned out to be a close election, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, my goodness. Was it one you were worried about then? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. And the night we took the, the taking those returns that night, <laughs> we asked people to bring the returns to the House. So these people are not trained poll workers, if you know what I mean. They're not trained political people. So I'll never forget uh, people coming from uh, the far reach of the district, coming in with the returns. I said, okay, in the 10th Division, you got 32 votes. In the 11th Division, you got, I said, well, wait a minute. How many did the opposition get? Oh, you just told us to bring your returns. <laughs> so, so that night, everybody had to go back out to the polling places and try and find out what the actual results are. So we were on the edges of our seats all night. I can imagine. Yeah. Why do you think you were a target? Uh, well, in politics, whatever you have is, you know, it's an open system. So whatever you have, somebody else might want. Let's begin with that. Um, second, um, I think it made sense for the mayor and those people to get rid of me um, because I was not part of their team, part of their organization. Um, I, th I think they were afraid that under pressure I might do the right thing, and we can't have that. So, uh, But uh, it, it was just a political competition. How would you characterize Philadelphia politics? Um, I think the same as every place else, except more so. Uh, the, the dynamics of politics don't change much place to place, particularly in partisan situations, you know, like Philadelphia. Um, I think it's a spirited competition. It's historically has been very grassroots. Um, I think it's very healthy. I think it has been poisoned gradually over the years by money. So I, I think it's probably changed to everyone's detriment, including the participants. What do you recall about your swearing in? Uh, as a House member? Yes. Well, and coming to the House for the first time? Well, my swearing in I, it didn't strike me as terribly memorable. Um, 
I was there. It was a mass. I mean, the, the house chamber itself is, a mag is magnificent, if a little bit overwhelming. Um, I thought it was an exciting moment, certainly, but not something really sticks in my memory. Uh, after the swearing in and things settled down a little bit, um, I commented, and this was certainly taken the wrong way, but I commented that I thought the house w was much like a street corner in the sense that people sorted themselves out informally. You know, I certainly should have chosen a, a, more, a, a less unflattering uh, analogy, but, you know, people sort themselves out, you know, and each of the characters that you might find on a, in a city setting, let's make it a playground, I hesitate to make it a bar, um, each of those characters in, it plays out their own role in the drama, it's self-defining, and, uh, and I, I use that analogy, and that's the way it struck me at the beginning. Uh, then gradually I began to uh, be very uh, uh, concerned about it because the members didn't really have much participation in the decision making, and it was very disappointing because I'd come here not, I guess, with grand ideas, but certainly with a sense of, of empowerment you know, on behalf of the folks that sent me. And to arrive and discover that you really had little or no participation in decision making was very, very upsetting. Well, who made the decisions then? Um, there was a centralized power. The leadership made the decisions. The members, including me, had no real participation. They didn't even know what the content of the decisions was at the time. So, Did you have members who were mentors to you? Um, yeah, in varying degrees. I tried to learn uh, from as many people as I could, including perhaps people that I didn't like or didn't like me. Um, I tried to observe as many people as I could to try and understand um, why they did what they did and how they did what they did. It wasn't just about skill development. It was really about trying to understand this, this new world I was in. So I drew, I think, from a lot of people, but the... the the first guy that stands out in my mind is a fellow named Galen Dreibelbus. Galen was a farmer from Center County. He also had a number of small businesses that he ran. One of the most remarkable men to ever be in the legislature. And I had the good fortune of sitting beside him. I think it's because I was the most junior member of Philadelphia, so they sat me with the farmers. Um, Herb Feynman, who was the speaker at the time, later thought that was a mistake because he thought that I was falling under Galen's influence, which in fact was true. Um, so Galen Dreibelbus uh, used to actually instruct me, not just on the content of things, but on the proceedings in the House and the, the, the roles that the various members played. And one enduring lesson that he left with me was the importance of reliance. That what happens in debate is that it's impossible, no matter what your background, it's impossible for any member to be conversant, not even expert, but conversant in all the different areas they have to deal with, the criminal law, the business corporation law, the tax law, divorce law. I mean, it's impossible as a lawmaker to develop the necessary expertise. And bills are written uh, necessarily in a fairly technical form. So it's very difficult to get a handle. So what you find yourself doing is relying on other people. So people develop a reputation that when they take the floor of the house, you can generally rely on them for something. So in later years, for example, Bill Lloyd, who was certainly one of the most knowledgeable members of the house, was really, you could rely on what he said on the subject of utility law and consumer protection. He was a guy whose analysis could be relied upon. And one of the things that Galen um, uh, taught me was the need for that reliance and, and how to do it judiciously. You moved into leadership yourself mm -hmm. a few years after you were elected. What prompted your move into leadership? Well, it was either change things or get a new job. Uh, I just couldn't tolerate um, being... Uh, out of the decision making and it was just it was uh, almost insulting to just be sitting there and have no real role in in these decisions that were going forward so i thought if i'm not going to have a role in these decisions this is not a job i should be getting paid for i'll just go and find another way of making a living or i'm going to change that so the only way to change that was through a change in leadership 
Well, you are credited with being the first caucus chairman. Mm -hmm. Could you describe how that came about, how that was created? Well, um, I'm not sure how the job of caucus chairman was created in itself, but um, my role as caucus chairman and my definition, I guess, of the job was to be the, I wanted to empower the members with information. So I introduced the first bill analysis program. Uh, before that, the members had no way of knowing really what the content of the bill was, except for a raw reading, which is very difficult to do. So we assembled the staff of the committees and got them professionalized their t analysis techniques, got them to provide analyses of every bill to be on the calendar. They would send those analyses to my staff, a fellow named Ken Adamai, who collected them, kind of edited them, got them on a bus to Philadelphia. This is, we're talking pre-email and computer days. Uh, and then I would work on them over the weekend, get them back to him. He would go into print with them on Monday, and then on Monday afternoon, we'd have a meeting of the Democratic Caucus, at which time the analyses would be available, and the staff would then stand in the caucus for uh, questions. So I saw the job as caucus chairman, of caucus chairman, as creating the information base for good decisions and requiring and this was a deal I had uh, with the leadership, and it was stressed at points, but they kept their, their deal, uh, was that we would not run a bill without a caucus. And so I stuck with that principle 100% of the time. Um, Jim Mandarino knocked me down, I think, two or three times on that. You know, at 2 o'clock in the morning, he refused to have a caucus, but <laughs> that aside. Uh, and um, so I think that created a shift that I thought was extremely important in information and therefore power and authority, but also responsibility. The members at that point had the benefit of their empowerment and their information, but at that point they had the responsibility. You could no longer say the leadership made me do it. So uh, that's how I viewed it, and I, I thought it was an important thing to do. Well, let me talk to you about some of the other positions as mm -hmm. you took them and what you feel your historical role in them was. What about your role as whip? How did you become whip and what were your contributions as whip? Um, well, it was, there was an opening as leadership moved up. So I, there was an opening for whip and I was caucus chairman, which was arguably the job underneath whip. So it was kind of a logical progression. No one was terribly surprised or was not out of sync. So I ran for whip and um, as whip I was really the assistant to uh, the leader, uh, Jim Mandarino, who I guess was the second guy uh, from whom I learned the most. Uh, after Galen, it would be Jim. And I was Jim's assistant. Um, and the whip is usually the strong arm. Uh, and I have to say that I thought Jim was a stronger arm than I was. Uh, but my style as whip, or my approach as whip, was essentially to draw on that notion of community and to keep the members convinced and to give them evidence of this conviction that, that they were part of something larger than themselves. And that when there was a decision which was really a caucus decision, that they were part of that decision, they were obligated to support that decision. Because in, in turn, they would be able to come to the leadership and in effect to the caucus for support for something that they had an interest in. So that eliminated the need for intimidation, and eliminated the need for strong-arming people, and eliminated the need for that kind of quid pro quo uh, or log rolling that I think people usually associate with the process. And it turns out that the members were more than willing um, to follow that kind of leadership style as long as they had the confidence that you would, in fact, be there tomorrow and that you would, in fact, be good to your word. And um, and at that point in the leadership, we the highest value was you kept your word. So it really worked well. Um, but it was a slightly different style of whip, that's for sure. How about becoming majority leader? Majority leader was perhaps my most exciting time in the House. The majority leader in the House uh, has the responsibility for calendar. So you get to decide, in effect, what gets voted and what doesn't get voted and when. Uh, and you make the timing decisions about when there's enough support to pass a bill. Uh, you also have 
the most influence in shaping the content of the law or of the bill at that stage. You also in those days uh, had responsibility for negotiating the budget. So you were the lead negotiator in the budget. And that, of course, the taxing and spending decisions are critical in government. So it was the, the most uh, Im important but the most exciting job you could possibly have. So as majority leader, I, almost any majority leader really, uh, has the opportunity to participate in shaping every single law that comes through here. Now, obviously, you're shaping them with your caucus in mind, with the greater good for the state of Pennsylvania in mind, your own constituents, your own conscience, the city of Philadelphia. So the real challenge in that job, which makes it just a fascinating job, is the ability to balance and, and to uh, satisfy those demands which are always in tension. So it's, it's a, just the best job you can possibly have in government. Did you try to make changes to the job in your tenure there? Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, the, the system historically had grown up to be uh, a political system rather than a professional system. And obviously, politics is always in a, what we do here in some ways. But what we did, what I did was professionalize the staff um, so that people had job descriptions. They actually had to be at work at a certain time. Uh, they had a, a, a definition of their duties. They had predictable job pay because otherwise everything became bargaining. Everything was my secretary gets a raise, your secretary doesn't. Uh, that kind of bargaining went on constantly. And it was demoralizing for the staff. We were not getting a good work product, as good a work product as we should get from the staff because they felt themselves victims of this highly political process and not a professional process. And so by professionalizing the operation and providing training for people that needed it and so on so they could keep their jobs, um, it was dislocating, I think, for the members. And I think overall it was an important step. And then what we did was drew a line, because, in part because of the members' reaction and in part because of need, and said, you'll be able to hire back home staff. You'll make those decisions. Whether they're political or not political is not my concern. They will report to you. You're responsible for their behavior. So again, the trade-off has to constantly be authority and power for responsibility. When you say it was dislocating for some members, sure. did you feel it was a harder transition than you anticipated? Um, I knew there'd be problems. Uh, you never quite know. Um, all, you, all you're equipped with is you know you're headed for trouble. You can't really figure out how much is coming from which quarter. And sometimes it surprises you. Sometimes it surprises you. But uh, it was manageable. It was accomplished. And I think, you know, as soon as, as, soon as the, the, the first measure of accomplishment is when people treat it as if that's the way it's always been. Yeah. So as soon as people take things for granted, you know you're at the first level of accomplishment. The second level of accomplishment is when other people take credit for it. Then you know you have arrived. Then you know, that's a real success. And how about moving into the Speaker of the House position? Um, well, moving into the Speaker of the House was um, really, really a decision about moving on. Um, if I were going to have spent my life in the legislature, um, I would have stayed as majority leader. But moving into speaker, the speaker's job was really a way of looking ahead and saying uh, that I will be out of here in fairly short order. At that point, I made the decision that I, I think I, would, I need to look for something else and quickly decided that I would like to govern, run for governor. But at the time I moved into speaker, it was open, and the question is, what to do, how to fill the opening, should someone else fill the opening. Um, probably Max Piefsky would have been a terrific speaker. The job of speaker here is uh, institutionally, now personalities change things, but institutionally it's, um, it's, um, it's really ceremonial in some ways. You're called upon to be bipartisan in a lot of ways. You really need to be fair and judicious in the conduct of the business of the House. And you need to represent the institution externally. Um, but none of those jobs are nearly as exciting as the control over the day-to-day -day calendar and the participation in shaping the law. 
So uh, institutionally, you know, it's 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 not set up in a way that that is it, that it makes it the best job for a guy like me. And I also watched Jim Mandarino in that job. You know, when Jim became speaker and I became majority leader, he's a very forceful personality, and he naturally wanted to reach back in because there's nobody in Jim's view that would do as good a job as Jim, naturally. I mean, this is true of almost everybody that's had any, any power. And, um, but Jim made an agreement, and he kept to his agreement, and um, so he stayed within the traditional definitions of the speaker's role, or what had become tradition at that point. So in any event, so Jim acted as speaker, and I think he would felt constrained in that role. So I watched him as the speaker and thought, that's not where I want to be, ultimately. So speaker was enjoyable. Um, it was, it's a very prestigious role. Uh, it's an important role. And certainly, I would never gainsay it. Um, but having made the decision to be speaker, and then shortly thereafter, I decided I think I'd rather run for governor than be speaker. Did you try to make changes in your role as Speaker of the House? Um, some, some changes, uh, nothing, nothing I think overwhelming. Um, I tried to be uh, judicious, uh, less partisan. Um, so it was another, uh, another force to reckon with, the obligation to be, to be even-handed in dealing with the House and dealing with the debate. So it's just one more pressure. Um, I thought it would be useful to try and get to the public a better sense of what was going on in the House. And uh, the media certainly don't do that. And I thought if there was a way to get the sort of unexpurgated, unedited, uncut version of what's going on out to the public, it would be helpful to the debate and also helpful to the folks. And so I made various attempts to introduce television and some false starts, but eventually that happened. You're credited with introducing television to the House. Mm -hmm. Looking back on that experience, do you think that has had an effect on the House process? Not as much as I'd hoped. I think one of the great disappointments and perhaps it's a useful bit of humility, is that when you set the law or the system, the architecture in place, it doesn't determine human behavior the way you thought it was going to. Um, so I thought once the House, in its full deliberations, is available to the folks, two things would happen. One is that the members would be disciplined in their presentation because of an awareness of the folks back home. And second, I thought the folks would pay some attention to this and say, aha, that's what's really going on. Mm -hmm. Well, neither of those things were as true as I'd hoped. The danger, of course, is that one suspects that, um, that there would be a temptation when, once the lights go on to play to the camera, a uh, natural human temptation. That didn't turn out to be nearly as much of a problem. So neither the rewards nor the costs were as, were as great as I thought they would be. Do you remember the discussions at the time you proposed them? A little bit. Um, there, was, there was, as usual, some substantive objections. There, there were people using the argument for their own political purposes internally. Um, I remember um, the media exploitation uh, was awful. The commercial, I should say, media exploitation was just awful. And I thought, and I became convinced there was no way to get fair coverage with the commercial media, so I threw them off the floor and banned them from the floor, which resulted in threats of lawsuits, people coming to my office and, and raising cane and whatnot. But uh, we managed to shut them out. And then I tried to get the televised debate in and thought maybe we could put it on public TV or how to do it. So it was, I think, a little clumsy and probably was not done as well as one might hope. I'd like to show you some images to talk about some of these questions concerning your house service. Mm -hmm. The first one is of the Philadelphia delegation. Oh, yeah. And if you can 
tell us a little bit about how it worked as a delegation. Did you converse with each other? Uh, did you work on bills together? Was it a, a community? Um, yes. The short answer is yes. It was a, a delegation that worked together. There was a sense of unity and community. Um, but those who are familiar with the workings of democracy, with or without political people, uh, realize this, that working together is a term of art. Um, so there's a lot of bumps along the road. There's a lot of uh, very formidable personalities here. And, you know, when you get elected to office, it confirms your suspicion that you're truly at the center of the world. So getting ordinary folks to work together is difficult. Getting people who have been elected to office to work together is a challenge of a different order altogether. Uh, but the Philadelphia delegation, I think, did remarkably well, uh, was pretty unified. And even though they came from a whole range of political opinions, um, what they had in common was that they had come up through a fairly common political process. We all got elected pretty much in the same way. Almost all the state reps are neighborhood-based because the district is small enough. And these days, there were no media candidates. We all had to deal face to face with our constituents, with our wards, with our volunteers, et cetera. So we'd all had that common experience. And that really was a uniting factor. Also, um, the city of Philadelphia in those days uh, was experiencing some very, very difficult times. And that had a tendency to kind of unite us. Now, obviously, I mean, you're crossing racial lines, economic lines, all other kinds of lines, not to, not to mention just personalities. I mean, I see Nick Maley here in the front row of this picture, um, one of the most intelligent and remarkable men uh, I've ever met, and he's a, he's a state legislature, legislator. Now, I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of people in, in my 60 years, and uh, I mean, he's got to be one of the best. And, um, and people, I think, went, gee, he's a local politician from South Philadelphia. Remarkable man. Um, and, and many others. The same can be said about many of the other people here. You also had some longstanding relationships with people prominent in state politics, such as now Governor Ed Rendell mm -hmm. and State Senator uh, Vincent Fumo. Yes. Uh, can you say something about those political relationships over the years? Sure. Um, Relationships that develop over that period of time become both personal and political. And uh, I backed Ed Rendell, I'll never forget, he came to see me in my ward office uh, when he was running for district attorney. And uh, I told him that his chances of, he, he, I said, I have a theory for you. And, th and he said, what? And I said, here's, here should be your campaign theme. I said, you should take off all your clothes, climb to the top of the mountain when it's raining, and hope lightning strikes. That's the only way you're going to get to be district attorney. I said, but I'll back you. I'm with you. So there were three ward leaders that backed Ed Randell for district attorney. And in those days, Ed was a little less refined in his presentation. He, he <laughs> uh, I think we'll let it go at that. He was very forceful uh, and very anti-crime, and he would emote. I mean, it was, it was almost scary. But it was convincing. I mean, he was definitely sincere about the crime problem. So in any event, uh, he, he won. Um, I backed him for mayor against, uh, he ran against Wilson Good. Uh, backed him for governor against Bob Casey and the first uh, Bob Casey Sr. Um, and so uh, I've been involved with Ed's campaigns for a long, long time. Ed, I think, was primarily, I mean, you mentioned Ed and Vince in the same sentence. Uh, Ed is not because of coming out of Philadelphia. Yeah, sure. On a state level. But Ed is really was primarily his leadership style depended on effective public relations and having a good sense of the moment and seizing it as a matter of public relations and using that public support as the relevant lever, uh, almost as a way of going outside the process and trying to push it. Um, whereas Vince is probably. I mean, talk about talent, he's probably one of the most talented guys you're ever going to meet. And, um, and Vince's style, of course, was to work inside. And I knew, I got to know Vince a little bit in 1970 during the Schaap campaign. So we knew each other for some time, but we really became close uh, in the budget of, of 1989. I was majority leader. He was the, the lead negotiator for the Senate Democrats in that budget. 
and it was a very difficult budget. And things kind of, kind of ground to a halt, and uh, there was uh, tempers flared, and you know people's personalities started to get involved and everything. And and um, Joe Loper and I uh, uh, had a slightly different approach to these things uh, from you know the more forceful Jim Mandarino and, and the flamboyant Matt Ryan and, and Vince Mumo and so on. So in any event, we, uh, the, the other players, uh, the other legislative participants um, uh, gave us their proxy. So Joe negotiated for the Republicans, I negotiated for the Democrats. And th at that point, the, uh, the bond of trust uh, between me and, and Vince really, uh, really grew. In fact, um, the night of the budget resolution on uh, June 30, 1989, we get to midnight, we're sitting at the conference committee about to present the reports for adoption to be sent to both houses to pass the budget. And there were a lot of people who were quite suspicious of Vince. And uh, they said, you know, he's going to jam me at the last minute, he's going to jam me. So I kept trying to call it the general appropriations bill. and. They would say, FUMO's not ready. FUMO's not ready. So I call up the education bill, one bill after another, and we're disposing of all the bills around the conference table. And people are surrounding this conference table with sets of, of seats and so on, watching this process. So we finally come to the point where there's only one bill left. It's the general appropriations bill. So we've got to face the music. So I said, well, Chair, Chair calls up House Bill, whatever it is, um, printer's number, ba ba ba. Chair recognizes Senator Fumo. It's time. So there's a pause, and people are like, oh no. He reaches under the table and pulls out a tray with glasses and champagne and offers a toast to me and Loper. It was wonderful. That Great moment. And we've been very, very close ever since. There was also a media report that at one point he was trying to convince you to run for mayor of Philadelphia. Is there any truth to that? Well, he and I discussed, we, the mayoralty in Philadelphia is a constant <laughs> source of conversation. Um, the Pope will come and go, the President will come and go, but the mayor of Philadelphia is always a, a hot topic for conversation. Um, and um, at one point, uh, we discussed the, I, I don't know if he was urging me to run, but it was a um, prospect of my running was uh, under conversation. The prospect of his running was, in, was a topic of conversation. Uh, but it didn't ripen for either one of us, actually. What made you decide not to? Um, well, uh, in 1991 was really the opportunity to do that. Ed wanted to run, and uh, looking at the field, I thought Ed would probably do a pretty good job, A, and to B, I'm not sure that I could have brought to the table or Vince could have brought to the table. At that point, Vince was disinclined to run himself personally. But I'm not sure either one of us could have brought to the table enough to make a go of it. And also, we had uh, some confidence in Ed. Here's another picture of you as Whip. Ah, yes. With James Mandarino. Yep. What memories do you have of your relationship with Mandarino? Well, these two seats are together on the House floor, and there's no one else in that aisle. As you know, the number of seats in an aisle gets less and less as you move toward the front. So by the time you're in the front row at the leader's desk, it's just the leader and the whip. So you are spending a lot of time together, a significant part of which is dead time, in the sense that you're monitoring the debate you're not really actively engaged. Um, there's a lot of management goes on at that desk in terms of the calendar, the next amendment, and so on. Sometimes it can be frenzied, but you've got a lot of spaces in which you're just sitting there kind of controlling the action. And uh, so Jim and I, during those periods, had long, long conversations. Um, and Jim was uh, an, a formidable guy intellectually and in terms of his personality. Um, and uh, he was a blue-collar Franklin Roosevelt, old-time Democrat. You know, he was a labor Democrat and um, very, very deep in his views. Um, 
and it was uh, it was a pleasure to be with him. He was a man with very deep convictions, and it was it was very instructive and very useful uh, for me. Not just instructive in the intellectual sense, but it was very useful to me to see how Jim was able to lead a caucus that involved people with very very diverse views and opinions, and at the same time really stick to his principles. You know, he knew when to use those principles to guide the caucus and when he needed to flex to accommodate the other members of the caucus. So, and he would talk about that. But you said in your own style as majority leader that you didn't feel comfortable with that muscle flexing. Is that true? Um, I think you've got to figure out a way to use what you got to get where you need to go. And for me to try and pretend that I was Jim Mandarino, you know, I would not have, would not have worked. Uh, I think I brought some resources to the table, and the key was to be able to use who I was and what I brought to the table, both in terms of Philadelphia, um, the political support that I had, the support I had in the political community around the House, the support of uh, the Young Turks in the caucus, uh, and my own personal skills and inclinations, and to try and make that into a majority leadership that was functional and successful. Um, it's a different combination. And everybody that comes to the job has to, you know, not imitate the guy in front of them or the guy behind them, but uh, figure out a way to use what you got. Certainly Jim, Leroy Irvis was different than Herb Feynman, for sure. Um, Jim did not try to be as inspiring as Leroy. Jim did Jim. I didn't try and be as formidable as Jim. And how would you describe Herb Feynman? Uh, Herb Feynman was, uh, first of all, he was brilliant. He is credited with being the architect of the modern legislature. I mean, that is true nationally. I mean, Herb Feynman has that reputation nationally. Um, and he, um, he, Herb operated in the era of centralized power. He was the ward leader of the 52nd Ward, one of the biggest wards in the city. Um, he was a ward leader. He was... Uh, a lawyer. He was a brilliant man and a brilliant parliamentary tactician. And I mean, he used all those formidable skills. So he was really, uh, his intellectual kind of power, um, he used right, quite adroitly. And in those days, centralized power was the way it was. I mean, the party chairman was, you know, a major, major consideration in all political decisions, etc. So that was an era of centralized power. And, and Herb, uh, Herb was an exponent of that kind of style and, and quite, quite good at it, for sure. You had also mentioned your relationship with Matthew Ryan. Could you comment on that? I was a, um, I was a great admirer of Matt's. Matt was, uh, and I like to think that he is also someone that I learned from, he was a great wit, uh, but with a human touch. You know, they say that... Uh, you know you're Irish when you can tell people to go to hell in such a way that they look forward to the trip. Uh, that was Matt Ryan. Uh, he was brilliant and, and he really was uh, the best of the breed. I mean, he had all the Irish virtues and uh, he was quick-witted, he was brilliant, but he was sentimental, uh, but he was very humane, very decent, very balanced. Um, I think he was a remarkable man and, uh, and just very entertaining very, very productive, very principled. Great guy. In the house, you're also known for introducing sports <laughs> to some of the members. Could right. you give the background of that and your memories of it? Sure. Um, there is a, there's an informal aspect to legislating, and um, it's personal as well as political. And you need to be able to spend time with people and get to know people uh, outside the context of their voting behavior. And you don't get much of an opportunity to do that in the House because there's unlimited debate in the House. So therefore, it uses up the overwhelming amount of your day. There's not much informal opportunity uh, to get together. So what opportunity there was was generally kind of in the bars and restaurants. and. Uh, Eating and drinking is probably not good for me now. It certainly wasn't good for me then. Uh, and I tried to figure out a way that, that you know, we could be getting together other than eating and drinking. And uh, 
I had played, for example, touch football every Sunday beginning at age 17, um, certainly un well, until about three years ago, actually. So um, I thought, let's get together and play some touch football, and then softball, and then we played basketball during the winter. And it was a way of, for the members to get together and for me to enjoy myself. I love to play sports. I'm not good at anything, but I love to play sports. And so we organized the touch football, then basketball, then softball. And the softball was particularly good because the weather was nice, and we take a break in legislative sessions, you know, and, and go out and play softball in the evening. And it was terrific. I remember uh, uh, one particular evening when Pete Wombach's uh, wife put on a spread for us back at their house, and we used to sit out on the steps and... Uh, we were singing and, and drinking beer, and uh, it was it was great. It was just a wonderful time. So it was a social bond among yeah, the yeah, members. Yeah, it really was. And it's another way for people to sort each other out, you know, get a sense of who this guy really is, you know. You had referred seriously to some issues that you had with the bill process. Can you describe that and you whether that has changed it reminded about me. getting a bill passed, you said, can seem arduous? Yeah, but I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Maybe I'm just so embedded <laughs> that process. That this Were you able to streamline that process at all? The bill passage process? Yes. Um, streamline in some sense, yes. Um, one of the things that, that concerned me was the waste of members' time, or what I considered wasteful. It turns out that most members don't think it's wasteful when it's their speech to be made, when it's their choir to sing, when it's their team to be introduced. They think that's probably the best use of anyone's time, but they don't particularly enjoy it when it's the next guy's. So what I tried to do was to structure things so there was a lot less ceremonial participation. Now, in some ways, that created a little bit of a problem, as you might imagine. Um, so I tried to streamline debate in the sense of asking people for relevance and asking people to stay focused on the matter at hand and setting up a time when people that wanted to make speeches for the record could make speeches for the record and not encumber the legislative process. In terms of the actual processing of bills, uh, we did not change the process as such, but uh, set up fairly rigid structures for it. So don't bring a bill out of committee unless you're serious about it. If you're serious about it, let's have a work product that's a finished product, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Let's not do bills that are gestures. Let's do bills that are intended to become laws, et cetera. So although there was no formal restructuring of the legislative process, it remains the same as it has always been. The question is, how do you organize those uh, structures? One of the matters of record that did come up was your trying to change the House rules to prevent lawmakers from amending bills into unrelated bills, which also went against tradition, do you yeah. recall? Yeah, I think that's right. Um, the, th there is a constitutional requirement um, that, that is imposed on this process, and you can't have unrelated matters, but nobody quite knows what that means. The difficulty is that the integrity of the legislative process depends on keeping the Supreme Court out of it. You can't keep the Supreme Court out of the process if you flout the plain meaning of the language. So the, to keep unrelated amendments out meant two things. One, the debate would have to be focused on the matters at hand, so logically members could be prepared, understand, and make good decisions. And the second part is, that you would be taking a fairly conservative view of the constitutional requirements, that you would only have one subject matter, and therefore the integrity of the legislative process would not be at risk to the court system. And in other states, I've seen that where the legislature is cavalier about it, the courts will naturally step in. I'd like to ask you about some issues that you were particularly involved in during your tenure in the House. One that certainly comes to the forefront is education. Can you describe how you got involved in that and what was particularly important to you? Well, when I was growing up, education was uh, a real value in our household. And my father, although he was a bus driver and therefore we had limited means, uh, felt it important that I get the best possible education. And after grammar school, he sent me to a private Catholic high school. And the 
always encouraged more and more education. And I think it, it, part of that was the, the notion that you should make the most of whatever God has given you. That's your obligation. You don't have to be the greatest thing in the world. You have to be the most you can be, so to speak. Um, and also that, that economic success was important and that education was the key to economic success. And economic success was important not so that you would be rich, but when the next depression came, you'd be okay. <laughs> That's the way I grew up. My father got out of high school at the height of the depression. And um, it really was an important lesson for him that he passed on. And my parents felt that, you know, when the next depression comes, you've got to be ready. And that requires you to have an education. And f broadening that personal lesson to a social point of view, it's obvious that education in this country is the key to preventing the cumulative inequality of wealth. Uh, people that have money uh, provide for their children in a better way that gives them a better competitive edge. Um, and in the next generation, they wind up having more money. And there's always going to be a tendency for the rich to get richer and the poor to get poorer. Well, in this country, social mobility depends significantly on education. So education is a preeminent kind of concern and value for me. And as a legislator, um, I guess I had a sort of populist libertarian orientation. And so my first efforts at, at education policy and a continuing idea that I supported was uh, vouchers or, or, or choice in schools. I felt it very important that families have quality education and equality of educational opportunity. And it's something only the state can do. Uh, I mean, the government. Uh, it's only something only the government can do is to provide that opportunity, as opposed to providing a monopoly and telling you what it is you should learn and do and so on. Um, so that, that was the root of, of my first involvement in education. Why do you think it didn't go farther than it did? It never got passed, correct? Uh, no, school choice never got passed. Uh, vouchers never got passed. Um, the, there were various attempts made by different people at different times. Certainly, I was a con constant supporter of uh, that in various forms. Tax credits, uh, education tax credits, are now law in Pennsylvania. I think that has value. Um, in higher education, we have support, which is essentially vouchered uh, through FIA and through institutional support of colleges. Um, we have charter schools now, thanks to Tom Ridge. I mean, he led that fight. Uh, he, he led the fight for vouchers and was not successful and settled for uh, half a loaf, which is common here in Harrisburg, but I give him a lot of credit. Um, so he, he achieved charter schools, which I think are an important step forward. So, um, and I think the, the voucher, the school choice movement has had measures of success around the country, but it's certainly, uh, certainly not what I would like to see. And I don't think it, it's a real uphill fight because, uh, first of all, the, there is the political power of the folks that are the public school establishment at the moment. Um, second, there is a genuine conviction uh, on many people's part that we need a, uh, a monopolistic, that, that sort of gives away my point of view, but you need a consistent uh, philosophy being embedded in the children and uh, public schools is the way to do that, conventional public schools. It's a genuine point of view. And there's an orthodoxy which people subscribe to. And frankly, in many parts of Pennsylvania, public schools work well enough that people are saying, why would we experiment with something new? Um, Pennsylvania is not the kind of state which is anxious to, to try new things. So I think there's a concern about where that would all lead. And finally, I think that there is other than the legitimate point of view, uh, opposite school choice, there's also a sort of a paternalistic uh, attitude that really can these people choose for themselves? I mean, uh, don't we know better than they what's good for their children? And I think that is probably the root of the issue. The question is, who is responsible and who should decide the education of children? And in my opinion, it starts with the family. When you were advocating for this, did you get 
any flack because you were supporting a Republican platform? Well, it didn't, wasn't a Republican platform at the time. Uh, when, I first, uh, when I first ran for office, I was a left winger. It was only later that I was a right winger, even though my position never changed. Uh, this was not a Republican platform issue whatsoever. Don't forget, we're going back now to the 60s. Uh, and the notion of equality of educational opportunity uh, was a frightening idea for people in the suburbs thinking, oh my God, you know, does that mean everybody gets the same educational shot? We've moved to the suburbs, we're spending all this money, so our children have a superior education, and now suddenly everybody's going to have an equal opportunity. So the notion of equality of opportunity and divorcing economics from school opportunity was a radical kind of left-wing idea, I think. And the Republicans, uh, very thoughtfully, very cleverly, have adopted a a populist theme. And so they have, if you're a populist, at this point in history, you're more likely to be a Republican than a Democrat, which is amazing, amazing to me, but they've done that very well. So I got a lot of flack, yes. Because it was a Republican program, no. Because it wasn't at the time. It is now. Another issue that you were very prominent in was tax reform. Yeah particularly the wage tax. Can you talk about the background of that? Because that took some time, apparently, to get through. Yeah. The, um, uh, that was another humbling experience. Uh, tax reform uh, is a word that doesn't translate well. People are not genuinely interested in tax reform. They're genuinely interested in tax relief. They want lower taxes, not different taxes, and, <laughs> and they want lower taxes for them. So you find yourself in any discussion with the public on the subject of tax reform, people are sitting there doing not so hypothetical tax returns. They're asking questions, uh, suppose someone had the following income but also paid the following amount of property tax, would he be better off, this hypothetical person? And it was always amusing to me. Um, trying to rationalize a tax base in a way that, that supported economic growth and economic development for the greater good um, to run into very, very narrow uh, concern. It's, 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 I guess, an obvious point, but it's, uh, it's a humbling experience to be trying to promote a tax reform package uh, or, or a set of tax structural changes. Um, and be frustrated by that kind of mentality. I mean, I think the difficulty is this. I, I always prefer to take, to put the responsibility and the authority in the same place. If you want a certain level of government to achieve a certain num level of tasks, then you have to support it financially. If you don't want, for example, cities in Pennsylvania to perform those functions, that's okay with me. I'm okay with that. But if you want them to perform those functions, then you have to pay for it. If you don't want to pay for it, you don't get the functions, period. And what happens is everybody wants more government than they're willing to pay for. So what happens is the people run for office and are reluctant to tell the folks the truth. So they say, well, if you elect me, um, you could have all the government you want, not have to spend another dime because I'm going to get rid of the waste, corruption, and inefficiency. And that'll take care of it. Okay. So then a guy gets in office, and after a few years, now he's got a problem because either the waste, corruption, and inefficiency is still there, or he's eliminated it, and it turns out it's not enough to reduce your taxes. So now he's got to go back. How does he get reelected? Well, the answer to that is you could have all the government you want and not have to pay another dime except for them. Well, who's them? Well, whoever's not us. So if you're from Philadelphia, the answer is it's the farmers upstate. They've got all the money. It's this Republican-dominated legislature that, you know, is taking all the money out of Philadelphia. And that's why we're unfairly treated. If you're not from Philadelphia, then, of course, we could have all the government we want, except for Philadelphia getting all the money. <laughs> so their tax reform brings you face-to-face -face with the unhappy 
narrowness of self-interest. Uh, but it's a useful thing for people to confront, legislators to confront, because it requires real leadership. And even then, sometimes you're not successful with it. Which is why tax reform's muddling. The latest, man, the latest magic, of course, is gambling. You could have all the government you want, not have to pay another dime, as soon as the gambling money comes in. Well, of course, that's not going to work. You are credited with receiving an award for good government from mm. Common Cause. Right. What was the basis of that then? I think the basis of that was we had an ethics act. Um, I was not the prime sponsor of the act, uh, but it was my responsibility to shepherd it through. And, um, and I think we did a pretty good job. And so in any event, Common Cause uh, very generously, very graciously gave me that award. Do you think that there's still progress that needs to be made in that line? Uh, definitely. Um, the, the progress that needs to be made now, though, is not in the legal structure. Uh, as I mentioned before, one of the humbling experiences is passing a law and its effect on human behavior being not quite what one might hope. Um, I think what really needs to happen now is, again, a fundamental decision. Do people w want self-government? Uh, if they don't, I understand, because it's, it's rigorous, it's difficult, it's annoying. Um, we talked about the Philadelphia delegation and getting them together. I mean, it's no different than the school board in some rural place in Pennsylvania. It's very difficult to do. Self-government is not easy. The alternative to self-government is you're a consumer of government, not a producer of it. Okay? So if you're a consumer of it, you can sit home and respond to the most entertaining or interesting TV ad. Well then how does, if you have chosen as voters, as citizens, to be non-participant and instead to be a consumer of interesting material, understand that the cost in dollars of that is enormous and understand that the candidate then, instead of coming down to the local high school to talk to you, is going to be talking to contributors to put on the ads to talk to you. You have made that determination and therefore the money in the process is going to be just completely corrupted. So the notion of a permanent campaign, people now don't campaign every two years, four years, whatever it is. They campaign permanently. And they're raising money constantly while in office, not episodically. And they're using that money for purposes of advertising. Almost everyone now is a media candidate. And media is expensive. And why is it used? because that's what the folks respond to. It's not a mistake. It's not as if candidates for office have made some terrible mistake that the folks really want to govern themselves, really want to come down to the local high school on Wednesday night. Instead of watching TV, they want to come down and hear you. I don't think the candidates have made a mistake. I think they have correctly assessed the behavior of the folks. Now, of course, that, again, forces the wheel another turn. So, yes, I mean, the ethical situation is, is bad. But what's required is a change in behaviors, an assumption of responsibility, not a new law. And that, at this point, would be naive. You know what we should do? Pass a law that what? That what? I mean, it, it, it's behavior that it's about at this point, not legal structure. One of the... By the way, if I may add another comment sure. to that. Um, the... I now see the newspapers, although they editorialize against politicians and everything, the newspapers and the rest of the media will reward the legislator that brings home the bacon. So instead of voting someone in based on their character or their capacity or their philosophy, you're voting someone in for what they can do for you because don't forget you're unfairly treated. Remember. You could have all the government except for them. Well, what you need is somebody to stand up against them and bring home the bacon for you, right? Which is the essence of the corruption. So once you've got government simply as a pie to get whacked up, it's one large spoil system, and you're just in there elbowing for your piece of the pie. So that is a thoroughly corrupting influence. When the voters are saying, we want the guy, and the newspapers are saying, gee, isn't this wonderful, this guy? brought home all this money, gee, that's great. Well, then really you're just looking to be paid off. 
You have also had a colorful relationship with the newspapers, or, <laughs> or else they've often commented that you have some of the most quotable quotes, mm. uh, among them that journalism is a combination of fiction with fact, a good political brawl clears out the sinuses and helps the party. Can you describe the relationship of a legislator or of yourself to the media and their role? Well, the difficulty in, in arranging that role is the required hypocrisy. That's the problem. Uh, to look at it clinically, uh, objectively maybe is a better word, the media, in the plural, are, is our, a business. It is a business enterprise and it is defined by artistic uh, constraints. What I mean by that is this. I mean, you probably have wondered what has plagued scholars over the years about why the Irish don't rule the earth. Um, and it's because despite the grandeur of our culture, there's just so much of it can be passed down through story and song around the campfire. It would not include, for example, finance, <laughs> engineering, and so on. So there are constraints imposed by the medium. The popular media, let's take print media, are stories. Now, as you may know, in a story, there are two sides to every story, not three. Now, there's 203 members of the House. They're not permitted to have 203 stories. They're not permitted to have any more than two sides to the story. Why? Because the requirements of a story, it's a dramatic form. It requires a main character and a foil. They are in dramatic conflict, which reaches along a plot line to a resolution at the end. That's what a story is, and one needs a story, and the story must be marketable. If it's not marketable, it doesn't get in the paper. So from a clinical point of view, that's the way uh, it works. If you don't have a story to tell, you can't be covered in the media, period. Or if you're the third party, to give you an example, one of the earliest issues I was involved in was redlining. Banks drew, in effect, a red line around our neighborhood and wouldn't lend mortgage money in that neighborhood. Well, my point of view was that they ought not do that. Their view is we're out to protect our shareholders. I think that's a legitimate point of view. My view was do you need to rationally look at that house, that borrower, and that block? If this is a borrower who's a sound... Um, borrower, and that's a sound investment, you should lend him the money. Now, that's, I think, a very sensible kind of approach to the problem. However, consider that approach versus two other approaches. One is the conservative, you know, banker, you know, dollar signs on his vest. That's a dramatic character. And then the advocate for the poor who says banks should lend money to poor people, presumably without regard to the prospect of being paid back. So you've got the liberals and the conservatives, and there are two sides to the story, when in reality there are three sides to the story, and the third side is the only one that makes sense. The third side cannot have attention. It cannot find its way into the debate or the discussion because of the requirements of the dramatic medium. It's that simple. So, I mean, clinically, if you wanted to get press, you have to confine yourself to that medium. And if you wanted to be on television, then a, quote, visual would be important. The question is, how much of reality is lost thereby? The answer is almost everything. I mean, if I go home tonight and my wife says, how was your day? I don't think she's going to be terribly anxious to hear the details of my two-hour trip on the turnpike. Uh, she'll want me to hopefully uh, select those things which have the greatest interest value. Is that an accurate depiction of my day? I mean, when I tell her about my day, it will be inexplicable to her why I'm tired. Gee, you had such an interesting day. How come you're tired? Well, I didn't tell you about the trip on the turnpike. And most of life, and certainly most of, of governmental life, is the trip on the turnpike. Folks don't want to hear about it. Media doesn't want to present it. Did you find yourself then sometimes exaggerating or sensationalizing some of these quotes for the media? Certainly not. Um, 
I think you, there's more than one way to tell a story. And if you can tell the story in a way that's a little more interesting, you have a great, greater chance of getting co coverage. Um, and did I try and render that a little more interesting to the listener? Yes, absolutely. It's another Irish tradition. One of the places where you're credited with suggesting a third way was in the abortion debate, which was quite heated in Pennsylvania during was, yes. your tenure. So maybe that would be a transition to be able to talk about that third way and what the reaction was from the two sides mm -hmm. or why you called it the third way. Well, I didn't call it third way until much, much later. But um, my view of abortion then and now is that Many people are blessed with a faith that gives them clarity and certainty on the fundamental issue, which is when does human life begin? But there are many of us who are not blessed with that faith and that, therefore that clarity and certainty. And therefore we have to confront the religious, legal, bioethical question of when does life begin? And if you take both ends of the spectrum, uh, at one point, an argument is made that human life begins uh, with the fertilization of an egg. And the other end of the argument, I guess, uh, is the notion that human life begins at the moment of birth. And based on my personal experience and my reading and so on, I'm not convinced of either of those, may I say, extreme ends of the spectrum. And therefore, I have a much more difficult time as I think many people do in confronting the issue. And in trying to inform myself about this, I found an analogy um, between the, the development of a fetus in the womb and the uh, development of the species. That is to say, we have arguably evolved from a lower and therefore non-human form. But at some point in the evolution uh, of human beings, the evolution of the species, a, a human being occurs. And that is the moment at which God breathes a spark, a soul, into that entity. And at that point, you have a human being. So I thought that reconciliation of, of biblical teaching and scientific teaching of evolution, I thought the reconciliation of those two views in, in that uh, definition uh, was instructive. And I thought it would be useful to try and apply that to the development of the fetus in the womb. And interestingly, a lot of the early writers who confronted this, including St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, Aristotle, all, all talked about human life as separate from either animal life, that in the early stages you had animal life, in the later stages human life, or at one point, I think it was Aristotle, and I'm not sure about this, um, it, he thought it might be plant life, animal life human life. Um, so I found that analogy very, very useful in terms of confronting this issue. Now, I think we're narrowing it using scientific information. And people are trying to use various kinds of techniques as a way of getting off the hook. Uh, for example, a bi some bioethicists, I guess neuroethicists more specifically, are talking about brain waves and the existence of brain function as the point at which, and I think some people are saying, gosh, I'm relieved of the moral issue now. <laughs> the scientists have figured it out. Well, it's never going to be figured out with that kind of precision. In the same way that there's nobody who believes in, in evolution who can tell me what month and day and time we no longer had a lower form, and at that point we had a human being, because that kind of precision is simply not going to be available ever. So I argued for an approach which was really based on the need to be responsible as legislators to confront the issue of when human life begins, but not in a way that actually reflected either the pro-choice or the pro-life position. So um, I guess I should be grateful that point of view never got much attention. <laughs> um, but um, I remember, uh, speaking of attention, I remember it was one of the few times at the microphone when I actually felt that I had the attention of the House. Um, but when the debate concluded, um, Jim 
half jokingly because he understood, Jim Mandarino turned to me and said, so are you for it or against it? <laughs> so I think that that approach was somewhat lost to the debate. It's certainly lost to the political process, but is actually very much alive as a consideration for individual women and their families confronting this issue. You were also involved historically in the Philadelphia fiscal crisis of the early 1990s. Yeah. It, another difficult debate and period. Could you describe the events that occurred and, and your role in it? Sure. Um, City of Philadelphia in the late 80s um, was, was spending more than was coming in. This is not generally considered a sound way of approaching public finance. Um, and there was a total unwillingness on the part of the city administration to withdraw its commitment. So the city of Philadelphia is also a county and therefore has a measure of responsibility for a welfare function. So the administration was committed to a, uh, a, a scheme of support for the citizens which was simply not financially viable. And nobody would make a decision. So as a result, we continued to spend more than we had. City was on its way, I mean, out. It was just terrible. Um, so we were really heading for a terrible crisis. And so I convened a meeting on Friday the 13th, so that it would stay in people's minds. I waited and convened on Friday the 13th of April, 1990, and had the participation of all the people who I think could make, uh, play a leadership role in the issue, and included the mayor, uh, Senator Fumo, um, uh, a number of city controller, Jonathan Seidel. Um, there were a number of other people who participated in the meeting. Ed DeSeb representing Governor Casey. Um, so we had everybody in the room who I thought, except the unions. Um, so in any event, we discussed how to handle this and uh, couldn't really come up with some anything concrete that we could put in place. Um, and uh, so w we, we agreed that I would continue to, to study this thing. So I uh, did a series of, of inquiries and went up to New York and spoke with the Lazard Frere people who had designed the Big Mac, who, as you may recall, was a vehicle for New York City's recovery, and did some, um, did some research and, and hired uh, consultants who did research on uh, what are called the stress mechanisms for municipalities, which is tantamount to bankruptcy or analogous to bankruptcy and we explored the municipal bankruptcy option. So we did all the, the basic work to, to create some options. And uh, we got to that summer, but no real agreement had been had or no real progress been made. And Jonathan Seidel that summer was the first one to publicly state the case. And uh, when he did and said, look, the city's essentially going down the tubes. At that point, Wall Street, who had been quite content to let the city's finances slide as long as nobody belled, you know, nobody put a name on it. They were willing to ignore the whole thing. But then when Seidel stated the case, then all of a sudden Wall Street said, oh, well, now we can't lend you any money. So the city ran into a, a liquidity crisis. They ordinarily would borrow in August, and now they ran into a liquidity crisis and could not borrow money. So now the crisis was really upon us. And now it's like, oh, my God, we're going to close the doors. So I had a meeting with municipal union people in September because the municipal unions had played an important role in New York's recovery. But the municipal unions in Philadelphia were not invested, their pension funds were not invested in the city's bonds the way the New York people were. They didn't have the financial ties to the city's overall financial well-being. So although they, they I, I tried to present them with clear-cut choices, which were you can participate in the recovery and help shape it, but then you're going to bear some responsibility for it. Or you can avoid the responsibility, in which case you're not at the table. So they opted to, to not make a decision, which was tantamount to being out of the process. So we worked through the fall to try and develop uh, an option. And um, in any event, came up with uh, a kind of a broad idea about how to proceed. And it would certainly involve some authority with oversight power over the city spending. It would certainly involve new taxes, et cetera. And um, uh, Governor Casey was running for re-election, and um, he uh, was out of touch at that point on that issue. Uh, so I, I set a deadline and said, I'm going to a press conference right after the election. 
And whoever's there is there, whoever's not there is not. And John Street, who had been very helpful about this, um, uh, you know, and, and he and I stayed in constant touch, he said that he, he was not then president of city council. He said he was not in a position to lead the council on the issue. So he didn't show up, although he was certainly in the wings on this. Senator Fumo was there. Jonathan Seidel was there. Um, so we made the press conference. We made the announcement. The banks, uh, unaware of the legislative dynamics, the banks in Philadelphia then said, we will deal with the liquidity crisis and lend the city money if and only if a bill is introduced. It's got, as a minimum, the bill's got to be introduced with an oversight. So I introduced the bill on February the 28th, 1991, and um, it was just a shell of a bill, but it triggered the, the obligation of the banks, so they lent money. At that point, uh, there was a fellow named Joe McLaughlin, um, who was, uh, I think, lobbying for the city at that point, or for the Chamber of Commerce, I'm not sure which. In any event, Joe had been deputy mayor uh, under Bill Green and had seen all these crises and was really a very able guy. And he brought to me the concept of an intergovernmental authority. And that's something I hadn't thought of. So, you know, we got our people together and worked with Joe, came up with something. Then Joe took it to some very able lawyers in Philadelphia, uh, including a, um, a woman named Cutler, uh, who dealt with the tax side. Um, and, uh, oh my goodness, her name escaped me. It'll come back to me in a minute. Um, uh, in any event, um, drafted a bill and uh, went forward with it. And uh, so in any event, we got the bill passed, and it was um, a difficult debate, and it was difficult politics, in part because this was the city's first black mayor. And so the assertion uh, of, of an oversight board, you know, for the city's first black mayor necessarily, I think, raised some some concerns and suspicions uh, uh, about, you know, racial motivation or whatever. So that complicated the, the problem, as you might imagine. But eventually we got it done. We got it done, and subsequently Ed Mandel gets elected mayor, uh, having not campaigned on this issue or whatever, had anything to do with it. But the legal structure being in place, which put him in a different bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis the municipal unions, uh, at that point people were blaming the municipal unions, so that enhances bargaining position. So he had the legal tools and the political tools at that point, and then he went to the bargaining table with the unions, and he also um, really came across with a program of real fiscal austerity. And John Street got himself elected president of city council, and John was an advocate of fiscal austerity, and having these tools in place, uh, um, I think they, they did a good job and sort of Ed got in front of the parade. He's, he's got a great sense of timing. So he got in front of the parade, led it to a successful conclusion, and. Uh, and I think it's been highly functional for the city. Was it risky for you to go out on the limb and take the leadership in this? Oh, sure. Among all this this coalition. Oh yeah, of course. And why <laughs> why were you willing to take that risk? Well, um, oh, I'd love to claim some some moral superiority here, you know, or uh, but it was it's it was my job. I mean. If you want to be, you know, I was the most visible guy in Philadelphia in the legislature. I had um, a measure of confidence. I don't think they agree with me necessarily, but I think Republicans thought that I was going to treat them honestly, which I did. So I wasn't going to, you know, lie to anybody. So I thought I had the resources to pull it off. I mean, starting from the position of speaker. See, and the whole point of having the office was it gives you leverage to do other things. So being Speaker of the House gave me the leverage to be able to deal with a problem of this magnitude. And that's, that's what it's about. That's, that's what makes it a, a good job, you know? But it is your job. How about your another visible role you had was in a public fight to curtail nuisance bars yeah. and control the sale of liquor licenses. Mm -hmm. How did that come about? The same way most of the things that I was involved with came about, the neighborhood experience. Um, you know, the bars in, in 
in the neighborhood, some of the bars in the neighborhood, and a lot of the bars in the poor areas are really sort of centers for all kinds of misbehavior that spills out onto the street. I mean, you know, dr everything from drug dealing to misbehavior by the patrons, noise, the whole works, and just spills out onto the street. And the existing licensing scheme really did not attempt to cope with that. So uh, you know, after, after dealing with the problem over and over and realizing there was no remedy uh, at hand, um, I, I thought the thing through and uh, remembered the common law remedy of nuisance, of public nuisance. So what I wanted to do was to statutorily create a right of action. If you, this is sort of technical legal jargon, but you know what I mean. It's, it's an opportunity for people to go into court and have an enforceable right or an enforceable claim. So I took the common law notion of public nuisance and embedded it in a statute which gave a right to, for people to assert themselves uh, in a legal process uh, and to essentially close down um, nuisance bars. Then what we did was said, well, gee, should anybody have that right? Um, and then we talked about L&I having the right or the district attorney's office having the right. They already had district attorney's office under limited circumstances had the right anyway. And um, then what we did was Im took the further step of embedding that into what had been a pro forma uh, renewal of liquor licenses. And so that really set in place a whole set of remedies for communities to assert themselves against these nuisance bars. And uh, then we produced a, um, a, a how to do it booklet, you know, because no sense creating a right if nobody knows anything about it. And we distributed it and we had the cooperation of the municipal court in Philadelphia. And Lynn Abraham just did a terrific job with this. She was district attorney. It still is, actually. And she recruited somebody from one of the big law firms, um, some hotshot, you know, lawyer, and recruited him. And he, I think, essentially, not pro bono, but he took a tremendous cut in pay to head up her efforts on nuisance bars. And then we got some funding for it from the legislature to get it off the ground. But Lynn Abraham really went to town on this and did a great job. Many of the issues that you've been involved with seem to relate to community politics and empowering of community. Was this an intentional philosophy or is something you can reflect on? I'm not sure philosophy is ever intentional. Um, I think it sort of develops out of experience. My experience, as I've described before, was very, very local. And the problems that I saw locally, and for me, the, getting involved in politics was a way of reaching beyond your immediate responsibility, which is family, to a somewhat larger sphere of community. Uh, and neighborhood. And the problems that I saw around me were real problems in the lives of real people. And the key was to use power to generate a solution to those problems or to have an impact on those lives. I always viewed power as the ability to get work done, which I think is probably Isaac Newton's definition. And um, so that's the whole motivation. And, and it's the interesting exercise intellectually is, as in nuisance bars, to devise a remedy. And then, having done that, to actually use power to get the remedy done. One of the, one of the real disappointments uh, in office was the difficulty in getting uh, governmental, legislative, legal response to real problems. It's so much easier to participate in the large debate at an abstract level. Um, and as important as that debate can be sometimes, it, it, the disappointing part is that when you come back home, it, how much impact does it really have? Well, you referred to the use of power to work with communities. And one of the quotes that I was hoping you would elaborate on or explain or contextualize is that politics is a skillful use of a blunt instrument <laughs> credited to yeah. you. What, what did you mean by that? Uh, what I meant was that, um, that power is the key. Uh, but it's very much about fundamentals. I mean, politics, uh, when it's successful, when it really delivers, is really about very fundamental notions. So although a lot of force needs to be brought to bear, and there's a skill involved in bringing it to bear, it's really very much about fundamental notions. 
Do you find something distinctive in Pennsylvania politics compared to other state politics? I'm not sure I know a lot about other politics, other states' politics. Um, uh, Pennsylvania is partisan. It has a machine tradition in a number of counties and cities. Um, so in that regard, not unlike New York, uh, not unlike Massachusetts. Uh, ethnic politics, like many of those eastern states. Is it different than it is in North Dakota? Yeah, I think so. Uh, is it different than a farmer labor tradition in Minnesota? Yeah, for sure. Is it different than California? I hope so. Um, but what's happening is that money and media are tending to homogenize the politics. Um, so Pennsylvania politics is starting to look an awful lot like politics everywhere else. And I think you're going to find consultants now going from state to state and using almost identical political commercials, one state and another. What are your fondest memories of serving in the House? Well, I guess my fondest memories are really more personal uh, than political. And uh, certainly, there have been exciting moments, including some of the debates that we mentioned. And the, um, my time as majority leader, I remember with great fondness. But the, I think the personal kinds of um, connections, I mean, I've worked in a number of contexts. You know, I've been a lawyer, I've been a teacher, um, worked for the phone company, electronic technician. So I've, I've been in a number of job contexts. And I've found that the most, probably the most rewarding thing about uh, the legislature for me has been the personal kind of connections that I've made with, I think, a really remarkable people. What do you consider your greatest achievements? Hmm. Well, um, I think first uh, is probably PICA and the financial recovery of the city. I think second is putting in place some not terribly visible but structural uh, items that are going to be beneficial over a long run, like municipal pension reform. I think even now, municipal pensions are likely to bankrupt cities in Pennsylvania. Um, so there are those kind of structural changes that, it, that I feel very proud of, which are not terribly visible, but which I think are going to be helpful in the long run. And then I think I'm also proud of, and I don't know if you'd call this an achievement, but to be a consistent supporter and a consistent voice uh, for causes even when they lose. Uh, like, for example, school choice. You mentioned disappointment previously. What regrets do you have? No regrets. Or were there frustrations as a House member? Oh, sure. But I, you know, my dad would come home from driving a bus. And, I mean, he'd had to deal with the public uh, on a regular basis. And in those days, he had to work a split shift. So he'd have to go out and work the morning and then come home and then go back and work the evening rush hour until he got enough seniority to get the much prized early straight, which he would go to work, work, and actually come home. Um, now, did he have a frustrating job? Yes. Did I have a frustrating job? Yes. Would I have rather been in the legislature than be a bus driver? Yes. I mean, seriously. <laughs> of course it's frustrating. Who doesn't have a frustrating job? How do you think Robert O'Donnell should be remembered? in the House? I would like to be remembered as somebody who left things better than he found them. And at the end of the day, that it was good that he was here. Can you tell us what you're doing now and how your experience in the House relates to it? Well. I do government relations consulting. I represent the Philadelphia School District. Uh, I have a law practice where I represent primarily charter schools. Um, I do public finance work as an attorney. And um, on and off, I've done teaching and um, uh, lots of other things as they come up that interest me. You left the House in the early 90s. Did you ever have thoughts of re-entering politics? Well. Um, in some sense, I haven't actually left um, because I remain a supporter of many friends who are still in it, and I still have opinions. Uh, and uh, 
I think my wife would like me to find some venue for those opinions, but probably not elective office. You also had a role in national politics, didn't you, working yes. for Clinton Gore? Yeah. Say how that occurred? And yeah, I, uh, uh, I was Clinton's chairman in 92, and uh, the most remarkable man I've ever met in politics. Um, I was his chairman in Pennsylvania here, and uh, I had met him through a mutual friend um, who was uh, a fellow named Neil Steinman. He was the most intelligent man I've ever met in my life, uh, since deceased. And in any event, he introduced me to Bill and Hillary Clinton. And in 91, in November of 91, uh, Neil said, look, Bill's going to run for president. You ought to get involved, you know. And I said, well, I don't know. Have him call me. So anyway, Clinton called me. And at the time, it's hard to remember this, but at the time, he was like a nobody guy from a small southern state. So in any event, he called and said, look, let's get together. So he, he came up here to Pennsylvania. We sat and talked. Uh, he uh, was, I signed on as chairman of the campaign, took him around Pennsylvania beginning in the late fall of, uh, or in December of, of 91 and then into 92, and um, took him around Pennsylvania, introduced him to people, recruited the delegates, you know, and put together the field operation in Pennsylvania for him. And, um, and it was just a f terrific experience. He had a terrific team, um, and not the least of which was Hillary. Uh, and uh, in any event, um, uh, ran through the campaign, was successful. And then the general election, I played a much lesser role because at that point, the field stuff is not nearly as relevant as the tarmac campaign. You know, they fly in, do press, and fly out. Um, but what was really interesting after that was uh, you're never quite sure in this business when, when people are going to be taken with themselves, you know, and become important. And sometimes it's when they're secretary, treasurer, or the Moose Lodge, you know, and sometimes it happens much later, but you're always kind of waiting for it, it to happen. It never happened with Bill Clinton. He was the same guy, uh, even as president. And I remember my, uh, my wife, Donna, and I have been to the White House a number of times for, for dinner and events and so on. And Clinton was as down to earth then as he ever was. Well, you He's a remarkable man. You called him a remarkable man a couple times. What, what was remarkable about him? You know, they say um, he, he's been accused of being a liar, and he's been accused of, of being a phony and pretending. And I think what people don't understand is that he actually had inside uh, a range of emotions that were genuine, that enabled him to relate, to connect, to other people, not just to the camera, not just to the audience, but to individual human beings. He had the ability, um, like, like a guy that can play the piano without reading a word of music. You know, you could hum a few bars and he can pick it up. Bill Clinton could pick up where you were, and he didn't just mirror it back to you. He found your experience inside himself. It sounds strange, but what made him remarkable was his genuine, genuine empathy for the individuals that he would meet, including ordinary folks. And it, it was like nothing I've ever seen in my life. What does the future hold for you? Um, a few more years of, of good health and continuing to have fun. And um, I don't have any particular ambitions at this point. OK. I want to thank you very much for participating. Well, thank you. And I wish you well. Thanks.